do in those days. In those days, I remember it. My my dad would tell me it's a hundred dollars for us to go. And nowadays, it's like for one person, it's a hundred dollars. But in, it was a hundred dollars back in those days. And you know, had a house and um, you know bought us the clothing that we need. And you know, never never short of food or anything like that. But mom and dad just really wanted you know, my life to be a good life, and they did. They worked as hard as they could to make sure, and it really did happen. And amazingly, all the opportunities that I had, the fun that I got to have, you know. In so many ways, it's because they, they wanted me to have those opportunities and they, they wanted me to have that fun. But here's the thing. The baby boom is not just, you know, a whole bunch of babies being born. It's a, it's a foundation of economic growth in the, in the uh, post-war period in a huge kind of way. So we've got a whole bunch of babies being born, as I told you. And what is that going to do? I'm gonna, I forgot to do this part. Uh, one thing about the, uh, the baby boom is that I feel like they're the first massive generation of spoiled brats, you know. In the good old days, children would be seen and not heard. But you know, now these parents are wanting to do all these wonderful things for their kids. So they're, you know, let's let's spoil the crap out, which they kind of did, you know. And in the good old days, you know, it was, you know, ch you know, children to be silent. And you know, our parents welcomed us, you know. And so we we started talking. We talked all the time. And of course, because they're providing us everything, you know, we, we begin to want even more than that. So one thing that I do believe that the baby boomers did invent was whining. I think we are the great inventors of the, of the dynamics of whining. When my kids whine at me, I say, don't whine at me. I invented whining. You know, I'm so much better whining than you can possibly even imagine. So they whine at me, I'm going to whine double back at them, all right? Anyway, um, so these kids, you know, they're providing everything they possibly can for them, and the kids want even more. This creates a huge economic demand. I mean, all of a sudden, there's this huge demand to fulfill the desires and wants of all of these children, all these babies being born into the situation, and, of course, the adults associated with them. That huge demand led to a monumental investment. So every single year, the United States was putting about $10 billion into new facilities, new plants, you know, in, the, in industries one way or the other. So huge investments that will be a driving force of this affluent society. That huge investment will lead to monumental increases in productivity and production. All of a sudden, you know, production is increasing dramatically, in large part benefiting from the rise of computers, of course, critical part of the whole story and the concept of uh, development of the idea of automation, self-running machinery. And what it did was by 1960, production per individual had increased by three times. The American economy is just running, it's humming, you know, and just turning out all of these goods in this kind of amazing way. Now that increased productivity led to a variety of incredible new products. I do want you to know that much of the products of the 19, that are coming in the post-war period, we call it marginal variation. So marginal variation means it's, you know, it's, the same thing you could have bought before, but different varieties of it. So in the 1920s, there was like one toaster for you to buy. In the 1960s, there are seven different toasters for you to buy. And then nowadays, there is 20 or 30 different toasters. Toaster oven, you know, whatever you want. A triple toaster, a quadruple toaster, bagel toaster, you know, all of this again. It used to be when you'd walk down, the, and it's not just, you know, like consumer, electronic consumer durables, variety of irons, all these things, variety of uh, vacuum cleaners, but foods too. In the good old days, you would walk, even when I was a kid, you know, you'd walk down the aisle and there'd be like two different kind of mustards and one ketchup. Or the, and now there's, you know, you can be in the mustard aisle of a store and there's like 25,000 different mustards and you know, such a variety of cheeses and everything else. So a big part of this increased productivity or these new products were just um, um, marginal variation. But there were some new things that came in. And of course, these new things will just really have a tremendous impact. Um, one of the most exciting things, I told you in the 20s, the radio was clearly the most exciting kind of con new electronic consumer durable. In the post-war period, it was, what's it going to be? Tell it before I put it up there. Come on, you can do it. Yes, indeed, it was the TV. Here comes the television, right? The TV had actually been developed, I think, in the 1920s, you know. And I've heard that one of the first broadcasts took place, like, for, a tr I guess, an actual, I guess it would be, you know, sending the, the television vision from one location to another in the 1930s, you know, but by the time we get to 1946, this is when the TV, the post-war period is the takeoff time for the TV, and you see it right here in the numbers. So in 1946, there were 17,000 TV sets. I don't know if you've ever seen some of these really old TV sets. They're, some of them were like, they would be, uh, the, the tube was vertical, and then what would happen is you'd have a mirror and then, you know, the two would reflect off the mirror. And the nice thing was that you could kind of put the mirror down, of course, just look like a console and put stuff on it, you know, raise it up. Uh, I had a, 
I don't know what the rel relation was, but my grandma and grandpa, they would be out here, and they would take us to her, their friend in Orange County, and her name was Edna Dana. And Edna Dana had this really big, funky box. It had a teeny little screen, you know. And so I'm looking at this, like, in the mid-1960s, you know, and that must have been one of the very early TVs that they would put turn out. But, you know, 1946, there's only 17,000 sets in America. It would have been uncommon. That's the kind of era where you think that it's sitting primarily in the store window, and everyone gathers around to kind of see what's going on right there. But 1949, I Love Lucy comes along, and I swear to God, that was like a huge impetus, you know, for people to want to watch television. And by the time I was born in 1957, there are 40 million t TV sets. You know, TV has taken over uh, by the middle part of the, you know, so I, I am of the TV generation, absolutely. You know, so that was there. By the way, uh, in those days, of course, the TVs were generally black and white, and you had to manually turn them on, and you had to manually turn the channel, and there were only about, you know, less than 10 channels. You know, even in, in Southern California that you'd be there for, you'd have your VHF channels and your UHF, Channel 28, and for us, KCET. Um, by the way, I am pre-Mr. Um, Rogers, and I think that was in 1968, and of course, I was going to be 11 at that time. So my, my brother, my brother and sister watched it, so I was aware of it. And of course, way before Sesame Street, we had Farmer John, and we had Captain Kangaroo, and stuff like that that would be on in the morning for children. Anyway, uh, in 1963, um, of the TV sets that were being sold in America, about three million of them were color. So the color television came out in the early 60s. In 1965, I'm pretty sure that would have been the year, uh, maybe 66, 67. I'm not sure. <laughs> there's a re there's a way to find this out, you know. But my best friend Duff, and by the way, this is pretty much the reason he was my best friend. And if Duff, you're watching, I apologize. But I, his family got a color TV. And so that meant that I always wanted to spend the night at Duff's house. And the, and the fun nights to spend were Friday nights, because on Friday night we could watch Star Trek, and then on Saturday morning we could all watch all the cartoons. So here comes color. You know, in my house, we, my mom and dad were a little bit stingy in this regard. We kept our black and white for quite a long time. And so when the wonderful world of Disney would come, in on, come on on Sunday night, you know, Tinkerbell comes out and she would splash her little color. You know. So for me it was like dark gray, darker gray, darker gray, you know, something like that, instead of you know, in living color, something like that. So um, anyway, here comes the television, changing behaviors, of course, children glued to the, to the boob tube, of course, changing advertising in a huge way, changing politics. All of a sudden it became very important how you looked on television. So one of the things they say, you know, it's a tight race between John F. Kennedy and Richard N uh, Nixon in 1960, but Nixon, you know, in, the, in black and white, he came off with kind of like a five o'clock shadow and a real dark kind of visage. And here's, you know, bright, shining, blonde hair, John F. Kennedy looking so much better, you know, so telegentic that, you know, people look, ooh, I don't want to, look at, don't want to vote for Nixon. Uh, Kennedy, he's, he's all good looking. Anyway, so you, you know, you're seeing this transformation in a huge kind of way. Uh, here comes the TV, and everything's going to change in, in, a, in a very substantial way. Something else that came into play were plastics. I don't know if you guys have ever seen The Graduate, but, you know, the Graduate, the movie, he's coming, he's graduated from college, he's coming home, you know, and a guy, there's a party to welcome him back from graduation, and this older man takes him out by the pool, and he's, you know, he's telling this graduate, you know, here's the thing that's going to make the future, plastics. And it's weird, because, you know, this is the emergence of the plastic generation, and you see Tupperware, and, you know, all these, I, this isn't exactly the same thing, but I think of, you know, all the lawn types things, Teflon, Orlon, Dacron, nylon, you know, all these things, these synthetic materials that are coming into play at this time. You know, we don't exactly know what the impact of all these things are upon us. You know, plastics might be doing damage to us. There have been a rise in autoimmune problems you know, in the baby boomer generation. You know, may, maybe it's because we were the first generation to be exposed to plastics significantly over the course of our lifetime. You know, all these little things you have to worry about. And of course, they just dove into the world of plastics, and it, you guys all know this, and it, it's become horrific in some ways, the impact of all of this, you know, all the pla plastic refuse around the world, and the fact that it doesn't biodegrade, and it just breaks into small and smaller pieces, and it becomes the microplastics of the ocean, you know, inv invading the, the habitats, the, the ecosystems of the oceans in ways that are just kind of horrible to even contemplate. But, you know, this was something new, this was something exciting. And it really did then begin to create kind of the foundations of this extraordinarily affluent society. Leisure time activities increased dramatically because they had, you know, you got the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act saying the 40-hour week, you know. So all of a sudden there's a weekend for everybody. 
And then, you know, you got money too, because jobs are paying pretty well, even for you know, those that are involved in manufacturing, they're doing really well for themselves. And people are taking more vacations. And we see the number of motels expanding and hotels expanding and American travels, American travelers abroad. Uh, camping became a really big deal. RVs, recreational vehicles became a really big deal. There was a, a movie that was Lucy and Desi. It was called The Long Trailer. And, you know, all their little crazy things that happened while they took this really long trailer pulled by some big old car, you know, the way they would do it. But I swear that's the foundation. Like, you know, everyone's, oh, we want to do that too. We want to get a trailer. We want to get an RV. Uh, various leisure time activities. The number of golf courses explode in America. The number of swimming pools explodes in, explodes in America. You know, miniature golf, um, bowling alleys, you know, all these things that you could do. And then, you know, um, pop culture, pop art, and people wanted to have pop art as part of that. Or um, paperback books, you know, the, the pulp fiction became huge in terms of what people wanted. But they also wanted it to be a little fancier, so they liked imported cars. You wanted to have your Jaguar, or you wanted to have your Lowenbrow, you know. It's so funny when I was a kid, in high school, Lowenbrow was the thing. And of course, we all thought this was some kind of imported European beer. I think it was made by the Coors Company or something like that, just yanking our chain a bit. But, you know, everyone wanted to have these, all these, and of course they could, they could have all this. And just, you know, one manifestation of this, which I find really, well, this is personal, so I do kind of like it. Um, youth spending. You know, the baby boomers were, I told you, spoiled brats, and their mom and dads gave them allowances. You know, kids didn't have money in the 19th century. No kid ever had any money. But now we did. We had money in the pocket, money to burn. And so we're heading off in various places. To do, I, I should have told you this. The amount of youth spending, so that would be spending of children under the age of, I think the way they did it was around 15, was routinely equal to like the GMP of Austria or you know some other smaller European country. American youth had a lot of money in the pocket, and they're going out there and they're spending millions of dollars. And I was part of that. And we would go, my friends and I would go to Sage's Toy Store. So Sage's was like kind of a walmart -y type, well, I'd say more like a, I guess that's a good, uh, walmart -y type store back in the good old days, you know, had everything in it, a grocery store, had all kinds of stuff. But they also had their separate toy store in Riverside, and we just loved to go there and get our hot, I don't think I was a hot wheel person, but there were things that, I can't remember what the toys were, sorry about that. We'd get our fun toys and do that kind of stuff, models, things that we would buy and take, uh, take home and build. We would also go over to the main Sage's store. This is just down, you know, blocks down from where I live, and we would go to the records portion, of course, this was a big thing for us, and we looked at all the LPs, of course, we looked at all the 45s, and, you know, what I would do, of course, everybody did what they wanted to, but um, our babysitter, so this would have been around 64, something like that, but our babysitter named Kathy gave us the Beatles' second album, and my older sister, Carrie and I, Kirsten, and I, we just fell in love, like, instantaneously. And we played that record, and we played that record. We, play, we played it until you got to like see through the damn thing. And there were skips and everything everywhere. But you know, there came a point where I was taking my money down to the Sages, and I was going to buy the, you know, whatever Beatle album or Beatle record I could find. And you know, one of the expressions of, of, the, of youth, of course, was their new music. And I'm going to do a little presentation of music for you guys, but I'm going to put that on another track. And by the way, I apologize for what I'm about to do. So I hope that you enjoy it.